Hey Wanders, happy Halloween, and welcome to part two of our H.H. Holmes Spooktober special with Max. Like with the previous episode, we want to give a trigger warning as we will be talking about murder and the various ways H.H. Holmes used to commit it. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Spooktober 2023. So then following the World's Fair, Holmes left Chicago and moved to Fort Worth, Texas. Um, there, he, <laughs> <laughs> he kind of did like another like little roundabout. Yeah. He, ha- he had another lover um, and he married her as well. This one legally. He actually, I forgot to mention as well, he falsely married Minnie. Oh. Um, so he and Minnie were married to them, but like there was no actual paperwork. So it wasn't legal. Okay. So in total, he had at least one fake wife and three legal wives. <laughs> Isn't that what was wasn't that back then called a like common law wife where it was like we're basically married in everything but the actual piece of paper that like says we're married. Well, the I thing think with, like so, but that's probably but the thing with like Minnie is like he didn't want the paper because he's still in Chicago, so like they still have right. All he the can't he can't blow up his way. spot. Yeah, he can't like let anybody else know like he's getting married again because mm-hmm. this is right same area. So yeah, but like to Minnie, she thought it was real. And then she thought they actually got married, but he's like, hey, no, no, I'm, I have a wife literally down the street in a house that I bought for her. Um, so yeah, you just don't know about her. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah. So like at this time, when he's moving down to uh, Texas, he marries a lady the name of Georgiana Yoke, and that becomes his final wife. Georgiana. She, Georgiana. Yes. Um, so in July 1840, 1894, um, Holmes was arrested and incarcerated for a horse swindle that ended in St. Louis. So basically, like, he and Pitesville were, like, sell- like buying horses and something about, like, selling people, like, fake selling people horses or something. They got into, mm. like, weird... Horse like, swindling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. yep. Like, a, like a horse IOU. Like, if basically, you pay yes. up front, we'll give you this great yep. horse, and then no horse shows up. Yep, basically, yeah. Oh, yeah, so also at this time, um, so before, like, a couple weeks before he moved to Texas, he sent Pitesell down there with his, I think it was his oldest son? Um, so Pitesell and his son are down there, kind of, like, scouting out the area to build the next murder castle on this land. What? So, they're gonna build a second one. The murder they're- saloon? <laughs> yeah. You have the it's triple a murder layer. castle with swiveling doors. <laughs> <laughs> literally no the only difference. On it's the exact same blueprint, except the front door has this little Just saloon like the, door. Yeah, the saloon doors. <laughs> and there's a ragtime piano playing in the corner. Oh, heck yeah. Everyone it's just festive. has bowler hats. It's, it's on theme. All right. So while in jail, Holmes met with a convicted train robber and famous Wild West outlaw, Meriden Hedgepeth, a.k.a. the Denebear Killer. I didn't do too much research into that, so that could be a second podcast. <laughs> um, so Holmes had a plan to swindle the insurance company out of $10,000 by taking out a policy on himself and then faking his own death. He promised Hedgepeth a $500 commission in exchange for the name of a lawyer who he could be trusted. That's it? That's it. Out I'd of the 10000 like, I'd be like three grand. <laughs> Not for nothing. Um, so Holmes was directed to an attorney named Jephtha Howe, uh, who found Holmes' plan to be brilliant. Because of course it is. Uh, nevertheless, Holmes' plan to Holmes' plan to fake his own death failed when the insurance company became suspicious and refused to pay. Good for them. <laughs> Yeah, We've noticed yeah. that uh, this insurance policy was literally created yesterday at 12 o'clock, <laughs> and it would appear that it is now 12 o'clock the next day, and the man who walked in here on his two feet looking perfectly healthy, you're claiming, has turned to dust. Yes. I'm giving me my 10 grand. <laughs> Thank you. Aren't you that famous gunslinger? <laughs> like, like they actually, <laughs> he walks out of the jail to do it. Oh, goodness. Just lets him out of the jail. Okay, so Holmes decided not to press the claim and instead formulated a similar scheme with Pitesell. Um, so the second scheme involved Pitesell being an inventor named B.F. Perry. 
who was killed in a lab accident. The original plan was to find a lookalike cadaver to place in the, to put in the place of Peitzel, but instead, after Peitzel like said he needed to go home to take care of his sick child, his wife literally told him like, "Hey, our youngest child is sick. You need to come back to take care of him." So Peitzel went and like knocked on the door of Holmes and was like, "Hey, I need to go home." And Holmes was like, "No, he can't go home." Knocked him unconscious. <laughs> his right hand man. Uh huh. Yep, and then, um, so he knocked him out. Now he carried him to this building, right? He burned him, burned his body. Man's unconscious, but alive. Um, then he covered him, or no, he covered him in benzene and then burned him. And then he decided to pour chloroform down his throat, which don't really know why. Why? That <laughs> it, like, you've done enough. Know. Yeah, he's done a lot. Um, and then basically he put a pipe in his hand and made it look like he, it was a lab explosion. Like he got too close to his chemicals and he tried to light his pipe and it, boom, it exploded. It's probably he wanted trace amounts of chemicals to be found in the lungs. Oh, so really? like something yeah. was airborne, like if it was burning, you're yeah, breathing in like true. fumes. Okay. He just yeah. wanted them to find gunk in his lungs, probably. Yeah. yeah. He eventually managed to collect the insurance policy that he put on Peitzel not long before. Like, literally, it was like, I think a week or two before. Um, and he manipulated Peitzel's wife into allowing the three of her children, Alice, Nellie, and Howard, to be in his custody. Oh, no. His custody? Oh, no, mm -hmm. oh, no, 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 no. Yep. So at the time, like, Peitzel's wife was just brought into the like they told her what this plan was because if she, she was supposed to like, she was like okay <laughs> yeah if she was like supposed if he was supposed to fake die she would mm -hmm. have to know so like she could play like the grieving wife but instead like it actually happened and like there's a story of the oldest daughter having to go with Holmes to identify his body oh. to make, make sure that it was him and not just a scheme so she had to go with Holmes yeah so, while traveling throughout the northern U.S. and into Canada, Holmes forced both Alice and Nellie, okay, this is again a big trigger warning, uh, forced them into a trunk and gasped them to death. Oh, so the kids? Another, okay. The kids. All the right. little kids. My, I mean, like, he's already... He's crossed the Rubicon yeah. far yep. before this point. <laughs> yep. So I yeah. can't say I'm surprised. I'm not surprised no. either. No, At this point, I'm like, yeah. So they keep on coming. It just, yeah. Yep. Great, um, great, 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 great. He, he then buried their bodies inside the basement of a rental house. A rental house? Yep, somewhere... Yep, on the way. Okay. Um, then a detective named Frank Geyer found the bodies later on and noticed that Nellie's feet were missing. <gasps> this he, is like... Yep. He discovered that Nellie had a club foot and theorized that Holmes had removed it in order pre to prevent identification of her body. Oh. Oh. Yep. So, so this also, like, delving into, like, the psyche of a killer, right? Mm -hmm. You have a situation where you're off conning in Texas and your partner, you kill your partner, then convince the wife of your dead partner to give you custody of the children so you're you're requesting that burden of having those children sent to you and then you immediately kill them yep. so like on the hierarchy of like logic or like if you're trying to think through he's giving himself more victims to kill it's not even mm. like a business decision because it's it's just it's just murder it's only murder he doesn't gain anything from that other than like self edification he gets it. Um, insurance monies. Oh, for he the put kids. Insurance like policies out on them. I'm pretty sure he did. Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes more sense for him then. So that's so. why he wanted them. Yeah. Okay. He just wants the quick money. He doesn't. He probably. The quick. Cash. I mean, again, you have to keep mm -hmm. track of so many different like insurance agencies yes. to make sure you're not submitting to the same one over and over again. Yeah. That Joe Schmo that I took out a policy on yesterday is dead today. Like mm -hmm. you'd have to really be like, I can't go back in there. They kind of gave me the wow. bombastic side eye last time I went in there. There was like I forget which one it was, but it was around this time. He had like he was moving around from like Texas to Chicago to like so many places. He there was one point where like the um, insurance people they they're trying to get him because they're like they keep defrauding. Um, so they eventually had him in a room with like twelve insurance people. <laughs> they were like, "Hey, <laughs> oh, no. we got you. You got to sign us. You got to pay us." And like something happened and like he got away. Like he gave him like a fake name or spelled something wrong and like <sighs> he, so he got away. So they, they almost had him for defrauding insurance and then he got away. So he just kind of ran. <laughs> just say, hey, see you later. <laughs> like left. <laughs> so. Yeah. Geyer, the detective Geyer, he followed Holmes to Indianapolis. There, Holmes visited a local pharmacy to purchase drugs, which he later used to kill Howard, um, Peitzel's other son. Um, then after Oh, killed, that's who Howard was. Okay. Yeah, he's the other son. He's the son okay. that went down to, with, to Texas with Peitzel. Okay. 
So after killing Howard, Holmes removed his teeth before placing the body inside of the Holmes chimney. Uh. Yes. Then in, in 1894, Hedgepeth, the guy he met in jail, oh, yeah. um, told police investigators about Holmes because he was not paid as promised for assisting in his schemes. Should have asked more for more money. 500 mm-hmm. bucks. You can't not pay a, a criminal. You can't not pay a criminal. A, <laughs> if you don't kill him, you've got to pay him. Yep. That's how it works. Yep. Yeah, this is true. Yep, yep. So Holmes was then arrested in Boston after being tracked down by a detective agency known as the Pinkertons. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he was tracked down for horse theft. That's what it was? <laughs> yes. Just of keep away from the freaking horses. The horses? <laughs> the horses. They got them again. Yep. <laughs> I'm going to sell you a great, big, beautiful horse. Okay, where is it? Uh, that's the fun part. Uh, about that. Listen, okay, tomorrow I will have a horse, but today I will have your money. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't leave with said money. <laughs> So several castle employees were interviewed after his arrest. So this is back in Chicago. Uh, one of them, the caretaker, Pat Quinlan, said that the said to police that he was never permitted to clean the second floor. Ooh. The entire second floor? <laughs> There's you're three a caretaker floors, remember. and you're There's not allowed floors. to clean one third of the house and you don't think that's mm-hmm. sus? Probably oh, the sure. third floor either. I don't think the third floor I either. I bet this is the first floor. That he was yeah. like, not even over here in the first floor. It was just the lobby I was hired to clean. You, oh, can't, be a good care- you can't be a good caretaker if you're not allowed to take care of the house. We don't ask questions in these kind of days. Like You're just oh kind of like, I have gosh. a job. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> So this information sparked interest to search said floor. Um, there, Holmes's secret rooms and torture chambers were discovered. Police also investigated the basement in hopes of finding even more evidence against Holmes. Several human bones were found, um, and while exploring deeper within the hotel, a plumber lit a match and it triggered an explosion. Whoa! Left the dog on gas on! <laughs> <laughs> so this injured several men. It was later discovered that the cause of the explosion was an oil tank hidden behind the wall. Whoa, booby trap? I don't know. I don't. I don't really know what that was used for. I don't either. But <laughs> I have no clue. No. So in October 1895, Holmes was put on trial for the murder of Pitesell. He was found guilty and sentenced to death. So he initially claimed to be innocent and that he was driven to commit his murders because he was possessed by the devil. Oh, ah, the, the classic, eighth. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. The classic excuse. The classic Salem witch trial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. That's also fun. why I stink so much. <laughs> <laughs> like sulfur. Hmm. So on May 7th, 1896, Holmes was hung at Moisenmeg. Before his death, he asked for his coffin to be contain- contained in cement and buried 10 feet deep to avoid grave robbing. I think his grave should get robbed. It should, very mm-hmm. much so. Uh, during the hanging, Holmes's neck did not snap, and as a result, he strangled for over 15 minutes um, before being pronounced dead five minutes later. He was just 34 years old. He did all of that? Holy moly. How many times was he married? Like five, Legal- four? Legally three times, one not legally. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And his last wife actually survived. Um, and she was on trial, like, for his, you know, eventual Accomplice. trial for Pied Cell stuff. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know exactly what happened to her after that. But, yeah. Because it's not like she never really came out to say, like, exactly how much she knew mm. about, you know, like, everything going on. But she did bail him out of jail. And, like, so she knew some stuff. Mm-hmm. But it's hard to know exactly how much she knew. On this, the grand scale of things, she deserves to be let go just because she survived living in the same place with H.H. H. Holmes. Uh, I feel like you deserve to live. Like, if you survived that, like, I'm willing to gloss over if you... Because, again, if this dude was physically abusive to his first wife, mm-hmm. there's no way that went away for the yeah, other one. Like so, he like, yeah. like, these yeah. women are more survivors than they are accomplices. So, yeah. like, yeah, he's the worst. He's the worst. <laughs> yeah. He's yeah. the worst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but... The thing too that like I agree like she if she had like no part in it yeah she definitely should be let go but like I also find it hard to believe that she didn't know that like some of the killing was going on and especially when they're building a second murder castle. I don't know, but some people some people have second families and also, that happens for like thirty years. I would also say know. that everybody who was 
hip to what was going on, like really, really hip to what was going on, mm -hmm. gets like, off. So like if she true. knew all that stuff, he probably wouldn't have left her alive. If she had like like bombshell information that would hang him, mm -hmm. like I don't think he would have left her alive. That's true, unless he didn't get a chance to. That's also possible. Cause it kind yeah. of like went pretty fast. Like after he killed Pitesel, it kind of like but two years later. He but like he killed three kids and then it, like, that's true. It kind of yeah. He, and yeah. she was still there, like, hanging around. Yeah, that's true. If she was going to kill her, I feel like probably the probably killed so. her before the three kids, but, that's you true. know, I'm not, I don't have the brain of a psycho murderer, so. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I don't know that's anything. <laughs> All right, should we go into, like, the confirmed victims and then some hypothetical ones and kind of go through, like, what he did? Sure, you can do that. And then I have a fun little addendum after that. Yay. Some, some fun information that... <laughs> Is it going to be fun? It or goes is it into like, be like it goes into like a theory. It goes into like a wild theory that I actually think holds some water. But I'll let you okay. read the the victims list or the potential. Is murder there two hundred on this? List. Katrina? No, there's like twenty something. Okay. So. Okay. So the first. So this is the confirmed victims. This is the ones that he's admitted to. So December twenty fifth, eighteen ninety one, Julia and Pearl Connor. That was the the mom and the daughter. Mm -hmm. Um. Then um. They're both you know, poisoned and then killed. And then 1892, so the next year, uh, June 1st, Emily Van Tessel. Um, she was 16 years old. She was poisoned. Uh, December 6th, Emmeline Seagrand. Um, she was 23, 24-ish. She was suffocated in the vault. Um, and these two are, um, so Anna and Minnie were July 5th, 1893. So Anna was 23. Minnie, his fake wife, was 25. They're both poisoned and suffocated in, in the, the vault. vault in the vault. Mm -hmm. um, 1894 is the Pitesell family. September 2nd was ben, uh, Benjamin, who was the father and the accomplice. Um, he was knocked unconscious and then burned alive. Um, October 5th was Alice and Nellie. Again, they're both locked in a trunk and gassed. Um, then October 25th was Howard. He, he was eight years old. Um, he was poisoned and then burned as well. Let's see. So these are the ones that are possible that they're like not quite confirmed, but like they're strongly linked. Um, Dr. Robert Leacock overdosed with laudanum. An unnamed boy potentially killed. We don't know. That's the one that he had. And like they're like, is it Robert? We don't know. No, there you go. Weird, weird little <laughs> There's a couple apparently boys. There's one that we don't know happened at all. One that got poisoned. Um, there's Elizabeth Holton, the elderly woman that he took over their pharmacy. We think he killed her. Um, eight, in the late 1887, Dr. Russell. Um, killed by unknown causes. And then us unspecified dates, like 1888. Rogers, no first name. He was bludgeoned with an oar. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Char Charles Cole, bludgeoned with a pipe. Lizzie, which is like a, a nickname, um, suffocated in the vault. Sarah Everything bad happens in that vault. It does. <laughs> is uh, there money in this vault or is it just like a vault? I think it's just an empty vault. I think it's and just pushy. an empty room. Push yeah, push you and kill you. Yeah. Um, Sarah Cook. Um, she was suffocated in the vault. Mary Harricamp was suffocated in the vault. Um, let's see. Russell, uh, there's no last name. He was struck with a chair. Whoa. Um, and then these are in 1891. Racine Jassand, I apologize for names, um, poisoned with cyanide. Um, Robert Latimer, gassed or starved to death. Whoa. Wade Warner, burned alive. Unnamed banker starved and overdosed with chloroform. Unnamed woman overdosed with chloroform. 1892, February 8th, Anna Betts, 24 years old, poisoned. July 18th, uh, Ava Connor, poisoned. And then 1893, an unnamed woman was overdosed with chloroform. Another unnamed, um, unknown causes, it says, between like May and October. Milford Cole, bludgeoned with a pipe with an unknown accomplice, apparently. Baldwin H. Williams, he was shot and killed. Um, then more unspecified dates. Kate Dernke suffocated in the vault. Mr. Rogers, first name not, not known. Not Mr. Rogers! <laughs> <laughs> no. No. It's a beautiful um, day in the neighborhood. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, he has his nice sweaters, too. Um, he was overdosed with chloroform. And I think that's it for the it's like unspecified ones. It was like 200, right? 200? <laughs> 200, yeah. Yep. That's the Oh my gosh. And he's yeah. like regarded as America's first serial killer. Yes. Yep. So that's like the first one that they think there was. He, that he we know started of. it off with a bang. Yes. So then actually the actual murder castle um, is not there anymore. I tried to look it up. And then in 1895, apparently the murder castle was gutted by fire after witnesses reportedly saw two men entering the building late one night. 
The building itself remained standing until 1938, when it was torn down. And now, the site is now occupied by the Inglewood branch of the U.S. Post Office. Uh, <laughs> field trip! <laughs> oh, field trip, heck yeah! Um, but there are apparently, I forgot to mention as well, um, I think this was before he met Minnie, but he was still married to Murda. He, Holmes lit his castle on fire in Chicago. Himself? And, himself, because people like saw him the day before literally shoving everything out of the second floor and like the third floor, cleared out those two floors. And then like there was pitch seen like going in between the walls, like you could see coming Whoa. down in your closet. And then, like, this fire broke out. <laughs> you think Basically, that's what the oil canisters in the wall were for, in case he ever had to, like, yeah, blow up or torch the idea. building? Like, the fastest possible way to just delete all evidence is just have stuff placed in random spots where you could just, like, light it, and that it would just have blow been. up and yep. set fire to it. That'd make a lot of sense, yeah. Cause, Quick cash. <laughs> yeah, because this was basically what people thought that he did for insurance money. Um, and then that's what the, okay, yeah, so that's what the, that whole, like, group of people that had him in a room, like, the 12, 13 people that had him mm -hmm. in a room, it was for this incident, because they were like, you set this fire, like, you need to pay us our, we're not giving you insurance money, like, you right. need to pay up. So that's what that one was for. Um, and he kind of skipped town and never dealt with that. But yeah, people were like, yeah, it was him, because he cleared out everything, and then it lit on fire. <laughs> so... So yeah, I hope I didn't traumatize you too, <laughs> too much. No, that. I find this very fascinating. I'm always fascinated by this sort it's of stuff. Fascinating, but like at the same time, it's just so hard to like. I know it happened, but it's so hard mm. to believe that a person did this. You know, especially one who is so dumb and stinky. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like he below died mediocre. <laughs> below mediocre. <laughs> Oh, goodness. He was just 34, too, when he died. That's like, crazy. That's, I mean, that was like 80 years old back then, though. Yeah. Was like, you were done. You were over <laughs> you the You got married at 17. Yeah. Yeah. So were, my fun yeah. my fun little addendum that borders into the theoretical. Mm -hmm. So a couple of years back, I watched this documentary series, which is always a good way to start when you're talking about theories. Basically, it was a series created by a descendant of H.H. H. Holmes who is working with a former FBI agent to try and definitively prove that H.H. H. Holmes is, in fact, Jack the Ripper. Okay, I've heard Ooh. this. Yeah. Because okay. there are a couple different weird things. So they did, like, a full timeline biography. And first of all, they found that there was a bunch of weird unsolved murders that took place in his hometown, his childhood hometown. Like, oh. unsolved murders from way back. Like, way back. That people were just, like, found drowned in, like, a body of water and just... Uh, they didn't know what happened like just mysterious deaths um but all that's like unproved like nobody knows also you're talking about the fact that like he had love letters to spouses that he had that, like that was being found he mm -hmm. had a constant paper trail because of mm -hmm. all of his aliases and all of his insurance crap and basically before the murder castle is completed right because you said he starts the construction he's like i have this lot but it mm -hmm. wasn't determined what it was going to be used for necessarily so kind of knew but like, kind of but yeah. so the fbi lady who's working with this descendant of hh H. holmes is developing like a psychological profile as she goes like she's a complete skeptic but is basically saying like if you're looking at how a serial killer is made there are various things where they learn something and it changes what they do going forward. Basically, before the murder castle is finished and before um, the Whitechapel murders start in England, the paper trail of all of his cons, him and Peitzel, I think he worked with a lot. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, he just falls off the face of the earth. Just There's a span of time where he's just gone and there's no like, we don't know where he is. This guy who's constantly doing cons and constantly pulling illegal stuff, all of a sudden, he just drops off the face of the earth. They look and they find there are like travel logs between the United States and the UK. And it's difficult to tell because a lot of his aliases, multiple of his aliases mm -hmm. are on the plane roster because he's got so many different aliases. So it's like he could be any one of these. So the Whitechapel murders happen, and basically the first couple happen, or the first several, like, happen out on the street, right? They're mm -hmm. like, and all of them involve incapacitating somebody first, then murdering and dissecting them, right? Yeah. And so, like, some of the victims would have, like, organs removed and stuff. But the problem is, it's all, always a rush job, and he can barely get it done because of the, basically, the constables have these routes, 
So he would have had to like plan, okay, I have to go now. And the second one of like the last murders that happens, he gets caught like during a murder, a cop spots him and he runs away and they're able to get like a physical description of him. The last Whitechapel murder happens. It's inside like a boarding house and he has all the time in the world and he just absolutely it's awful. But he like completely dissects this person because he has all the time. He's not rushed. And so the psychological profiler is like, if you're looking at how a serial killer develops, if you take in the fact that he was doing all these insurance fraud cases where like you're trying to make money off of dead people by like disfiguring them or like selling their organs or their bones or their teeth, whatever. All of a sudden you have this guy who's obsessed with money figures out I could kill people and industrialize it if I take it into a place off the street where people just move in. People are transient. They move in and out. And in the World's Fair, there's so many undocumented immigrants who show up for the World's Fair like you're just gonna get lost in the shuffle. It's the perfect mm -hmm. opportunity. And so the psychological profiler is making the case that it's possible that it's the like some of the last Whitechapel murders or the last one that happens where he gets the idea to like, if I have like a boarding house or if I have a place that people come in off the street, I need time to be able to do this. So the crazy thing is all the way back then, their number one suspect in Britain for who Jack the Ripper was, was an American doctor. That's who they were looking for because the way he was dissecting people, only a doctor would know where the stuff was that he was cutting out of people, right? It's like yeah. if you're after a specific organ and you take a random dude off the street, mm -hmm. you don't know where to start, like if you have to take right. it out. But it's like, no, 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 this person knew where the stuff was. They examined um, like knife marks on the bones yep. that were like doctor scalpel marks. Precision. Like they were like medical mm -hmm. knives. So like not just like a giant butcher knife, like a precise doctor's mm -hmm. knife that would have been like sold standard in these sets that people got back then. And so the whole thing is just so wild. They The physical description, described a man of like of his height and build with the mustache they like created like the modern fbi lab created a composite image based off of the description and they hold it up next to a picture it's of hh holmes and they're like it's that looks exactly like him and then there was these other things called the dear boss letters where basically people a bunch of fraudsters started sending in mail to like these people in the uk basically claiming to be jack the ripper so like there was very obvious ones that were like this is a scam this is bunk this is just some horrible prank but there were multiple letters called the dear boss letters where the language use was different and details of the murder were given that were never given to the public so they're like only the murderer would know this but they had linguist experts look at his letters these letters these dear boss letters and they're like British people at this time in history would not have used any of these words. This slang, this slang's wrong. All of this is wrong. This is like written by an American person. Like this is not a British person. The whole thing's wild. And I'm not sure when, whatever you were reading off of about the fake grave, I didn't know mm -hmm. how much common knowledge that was. And I don't know how old the documentary was, but they got permission to exhume his body because there was cool. a, there was like a, a, basically a ghost story that said that there was some ridiculous claim that he didn't actually die, that he escaped. And so basically they just wanted to make sure the man was dead. Mm -hmm. So they open up his grave. And when you open up his grave, the only thing they see is an empty wooden casket and everyone starts panicking. And it's only until they dig down beneath it, way underneath, and his body was encased in concrete. They find okay. the bones and it's way down below. So that matches up. But the mm -hmm. way that everyone was reacting when it happened, it didn't seem like they were expecting to find that. So again, I don't know that they could have just been playing that up for TV. Maybe they knew all along he was really in a fake grave or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's the fact that like he, even in death, he wanted people to think he escaped. Like that's how sinister this guy was. Like they say, oh, it's for grave robbers. This man who has no respect for human remains whatsoever has the audacity to be like, I don't want somebody messing with my body or my bones. I'm just dumb and stinky. I don't want anybody moving my bones. <laughs> but all those details, it's so wild because that's the other thing is they're like, if Jack the Ripper never got caught, a serial killer doesn't just stop at the top of their game, basically. So they're like, how yeah. do you explain the Whitechapel murder stop? The man's never... He's spotted, does one last murder, gone, poof, into the wind, and then murder castle's finished, people start dying back in Chicago. And, like, it's a wild theory if it's true. It's just, like, a fascinating thing that I like thinking about because several of the things kind of do add up. It's kind of weird. It's really weird. But, like, that's just something that every once in a while I'm like, that's so fascinating. And, of course, like, 
the descendant of H.H. H. Holmes wants it to be true. He right. claims, like, oh, yeah. to bring closure to these other victims, if I can help, like, basically prove who Jack the Ripper was, it could bring, you know, whatever, like, peace to the victims or whatever. It's a wild theory. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if you stare long enough at anything, you can make up a theory about, like, connecting two things. But the span of time at which they were committing murders, like, overlaps, like, perfectly. It's really weird, really interesting. And again, like, who knows? There's probably a bunch more information that's come out since then. And it was a goofy documentary series. So, you know, as long as it's not about ancient aliens, I think it's more, <laughs> you know, plausible. But that's like my fun little addendum is the fact that, yeah, they would, I think even in his college days, he and his uh, college buddies would like disfigure corpses with acid, like disfigure their faces and then yeah. take out insurance policies. So like he was doing that for a while. Wow. And so the whole idea of like monetizing it, it's like, I need a way to subdue the people in private somewhere they're comfortable, where they're trusting, mm -hmm. and then find some place I can disassemble them. And I'm not positive if this is true. I think this was also in the documentary series, but I think he bought like a cement factory or a cement plant like nearby the murder castle that never oh, sold yeah. cement. And so. they they ran a uh, a boat out behind in the Chicago River, out like behind where the post office is now, like out behind the murder castle. And they just found like giant chunks of concrete just sitting on the bottom. Like uh, they, why. there was wonder constantly why. like you were talking about the trunks earlier. They people would report constantly seeing like H.H. H. Holmes and other people like taking trunks out of mm -hmm. the murder castle, which yep. like could have been people in concrete. Like it's a whole it's a whole mess. I think that number is probably conservative, like that 27 like confirmed kills. Mm -hmm. Like I I think I think the man has a much longer list as far as why he wouldn't like necessarily take credit for all those i don't know uh but then again like kendra said i'm not a psychopathic murderer so like i can't <laughs> i can't climb into that stinky dumb headspace to give you yep. that information so it is interesting especially like if he knew he was going to die like why wouldn't he say like oh i'm jack the ripper and like unless he wanted that like legend to still be a mystery kind of thing but I did Google like when the um, Whitechapel murders happened or Jack the Ripper. And it was from April 1888 till February 13th, 1891. And then the castle was finished in 1892, like completely. Hmm. So it kind of, it does like match up, but it's just like, that might've been like his starting grounds. And he then, would like, have to have been doing a lot of killing in a very short period of time. Yeah, but like basically that was the case that the FBI lady made was like if you're looking at somebody ramping up like mm -hmm. the Whitechapel murders got progressively yep. more violent. Oh, yeah. And so like by the last one when he has all the time in the world like he just takes someone apart. So they're like if you're looking at like a psychological profile this timeline makes sense. Mm -hmm. Which is like some a killer evolving over time a businessman killer American doctor. A businessman killer American doctor. He has it. Yeah. And the fact that sense. that's what they were looking for, too, back then. The fact that they were that's looking weird. for an American doctor back then is wild. That is interesting. Is there, like, I wonder if there's, like, a difference between, like, the ways they did dissections, too, to, like, help them pinpoint that? Because unless it's, like, if it's just from the letters, it's interesting that they could tell the dialect, like, just the keywords Even, I think, I think one of the reasons why um, they're called the Dear Boss letters is because mm -hmm. I think that's how he addressed it. I don't know if it was to like a chief of police or something, but that was one was, of the red yeah. flags where they were like, nobody calls somebody boss. Okay. <laughs> like nobody addresses somebody like a superior or like another person. Hey boss. Like nobody mm -hmm. does that. Like, I think that's probably why, but I think okay. the, the real, the real thing that tilted it over the scales, the thing that tipped the scales was the details about the murder that they were like, yeah, we never released that to the public. There is no mm -hmm. way that they would have information about the crime scene unless they were there. Yeah. Do we need like a palate cleanser, like a <laughs> like a happy story? Kendra, do you have a palate cleanser for us? No, I mean, we're talking about <laughs> kids getting murdered and put in trunks. Like, I do not have a palate cleanser today. Oh, uh, let's see. Google some frantically looking up fun, fun facts. facts. Uh, trees can make friends and talk to each other. I knew that. <laughs> Great. Uh, a the uh, the name for the little cardboardish type things that goes around your coffee cup mm -hmm. that's called yes. a zarf a zarf okay i like yeah. that z-a-r-f those little coffee zarf. things to protect your hands from getting yep. too hot yep that's great zarf okay i remember uh, that oh okay i found another cute one norway knighted a penguin named sir niles olaf the oh, third heck yeah that's cute. i love it okay that's a good one to end on i like that one <laughs> 
Penguin night. Now I'm going to have good dreams. Yay. (laughs) Penguin night. Penguins are so happy. I love them. Thank you. Okay, so some resources I used for this this episode were uh, Wikipedia, SmithsonianMagazine.com, MysteriousChicago.com, CriminalMinds.Fandom.com, and The Morbid Podcast. So if you want a very in-depth, gruesome, detailed podcast to listen to, check out Morbid Podcast. They got all the gory details for you. We kind of just buzzed over a lot of that, but I think it's... Mm-hmm. Okay. And then The Devil in the White City by Eric yeah. Larson. Is it Eric Larson? Yep. Is that movie yeah. ever getting made? I feel I like that's know. been in production hell for like <laughs> 10 years. Yeah. I, I kid you not. I think uh, Rhett and Link talked about H.H. H. Holmes like seven years ago and were like, they're actually making a movie about it. And they still haven't made it. Production hell. Yeah, I think it's going to come out when National Treasure 3 comes out. Which is Can you believe never. they have the gall not to include Nick Cage? They're not make what? 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 They expect me to go to a National Treasure movie with no Nick Cage in it? Yeah, I'm not doing that. Have they lost their minds? <laughs> oh, the world's going to end. Okay. <laughs> it better if they're making a National Treasure 3 with no Nick Cage. Maybe they'll put Riley in there. That would at least He's be fun. Fine I too. love Riley. He's funny. He's my favorite. Yeah, he's gonna have Ben Gates. What? Yeah, that's shameful. This, there's no excuse for that. You'd get everybody into the theaters. What are they afraid of? Everybody would go to see it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Wanderers. Thank you so much for joining us again, Max, and hanging out with us. Hopefully we didn't spook you too much. If you have any suggestions for any future episodes, please feel free to email us at fwplisteners at gmail.com. And as always, new episodes of the FWP are released to wherever you get your podcast from, including this place that you are listening to right now. Peace. All right, Wanderers, thank you so much for listening. We'll see you guys next time. Heck yeah, that's going to be the ending after the... The thing that screws me up, though, is that I'm a crazy person who listens to podcasts on multiple times speed to oh, listen no. to... Oh, must like, be fast. Oh, I, listen to, <laughs> I listen to, like... I have a lot of different podcasts I listen through. I actually just recently, like, caught up with a bunch of them, so now I'm in trouble where I'm like, I've gotten through all my podcasts for the day and I have nothing else to listen to, so I need to, like, dial the speed down to, like, normal. But oh, the no. thing that always trips me up is whenever I'm, like, I have a passenger riding with me and I want to show them an episode of a podcast, <laughs> mm-hmm. I always forget to turn the speed thing back to normal. So it'll start, and they start talking, like, really fast, yep. and the person in the passenger seat just, like, looks at me me and I was like, hold on a second let me just uh change this back to normal but then when i hear people normally it sounds like they're drunk like they're so slow <laughs> i'm like i'm not used to this much like silence there's usually it's usually so much faster so like the other day like when i was like binge binge listening through like y'all's podcast because of how many other podcasts i was listening to i had it on like whatever 1.5 or 1.8 like not even that crazy but the theme song speed is much <laughs> different so like the other day when i was listening to one on like normal speed like a normal person i was like do do <laughs> I was like, wow, this is the actual tune. I haven't heard the actual tune in forever. I was like, this this is the normal speed. (laughs) It's a banger.